Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Stefan Petrin. Uh, as uh, Adrian mentioned, I'm with Qualcomm. I'll do a brief introduction of the panel and myself. Uh, Adrian, thanks for introducing me. Uh, I have pretty much the same experience as Adrian has. I've been in the communication industry for about 26 years, and I've been focusing on research and development and uh, standards since uh, the last century. Um, on the panel uh, today, we have uh, three experts. So we have Lee from Nuair, Rick from Mitre, and Cheryl from uh, Irish Automation. I will give them a chance to introduce themselves briefly so we can all get to know them. Uh, but uh, before going to that, I'd like to mention briefly some aspects uh, about this panel so that we are all on board. So, for all of those of us that have been involved in UAS and advanced and mobility, we've always heard a lot of discussion about uh, command and control, how to enable it over cellular links, uh, and the role of cellular network and 5G for command and control. Uh, something that has not been discussed a lot is actually how to avoid the conflict between aircrafts, uh, how to enable DAA by using cellular technology and by using the 5G ecosystem, but also how these technologies uh, uh, can interact with other technologies that are not cellular, and what should be the overall role of all these various technologies uh, uh, working with each other. Um, we know that uh, in the aviation industry, we have various solutions for avoiding conflicts uh, and detecting it uh, uh, that can be based on communication between uh, aircrafts or can be based on ground supported solutions. Uh, and I think we think that they all will play a role in the end when considering uh, a DAA for UAVs. And we will discuss a couple of questions related to that. Uh, also, we will discuss uh, how we can make sure that all these technologies can work together. But an aspect that is also very important is uh, what type of testing can we do? What do we need to test and verify for these technologies to make sure that they can all work together, to make sure that the standards are mature and have covered all the relevant aspects of these technologies, and to make, in the end, all of these a reality. That, uh, that being said, uh, um, I'd like to allow my colleagues to introduce themselves briefly. So, Lee, do you want to give us a one-minute introduction? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I am uh, uh, Lee Nguyen. Uh, I serve as a contractor for uh, Northeast UAS Airspace Integration Research Alliance, uh, New Air. Uh, New Air is a nonprofit with a mission to safely uh, integrate uh, UAS into the NAS and enable scalable, economically viable commercial UAS operation. Uh, New Air manages operation of the FAA designated uh, 50 mile zero conflict UAS corridor uh, between uh, uh, Griffiths and Syracuse International Airport at a New York UAS test site. From 1985 to uh, 2021, uh, I have had extensive work experience uh, of the FAA certification and ops approvals, regulations, safety and security standards, research on manned and unmanned aircraft, communication, surveillance, navigation systems, and flight deck systems. Uh, for example, I serve as a leadership member of the RTCA 228 uh, minimum performance standard for UAS. Example of my LTE um, uh, for uh, aviation application work include uh, supporting the, um, in the uh, integration pilot program, uh, small UAS uh, BVLOS for GLTE C2 testing. I am uh, supporting the development uh, of performance standard for UAS uh, cellular C2 and the Open Gen uh, 5G consortium partnership with uh, New Air. 5G test network activities. I'm glad to be part of this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Cheryl, do you want to go next? Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. I'm Cheryl Contreras. I'm Director of Flight Operations for IRIS Automation. Um, I've been with IRIS for five years testing our vision based uh, detect and alert system. Uh, we have both a ground-based and onboard DAA systems um, with thousands of real um, 
field testing against general aviation, and then also simulator experience as well. Um, prior to being with IRIS, I have a general aviation background working on PPL. Um, so it's nice to bring that full general aviation, private pilot license kind of safety knowledge into a UAS um, a field where we're going to be testing out DA. Thank you, Shadow. Rick? Hi, I'm Rick Niles. I've um, been with MITRE for over 20 years in navigation and UAS work. Um, I've been with OpenGen since the beginning. Uh, I'm the uh, lead for the drone aspect um, um, of the OpenGen work. And I'm also the technical lead for both the new air and VT test beds. Um, I'm just happy to be here and thanks for joining the panel. Thank you very much. And I, I want to express uh, how much of an honor it is to be to on this panel, because for as much uh, as standards uh, may be an important piece of work, uh, sometimes it feels a little bit sterile because it's purely paperwork. You three are all involved in real practical uh, things uh, and making things happen. So it's very important to have your opinion and your views on all these topics. Thanks a lot for being part of this panel. I would suggest that we jump directly into it. So uh, I think uh, many people have been hearing about the tech and avoid. Uh, uh, I think an important topic to discuss is what do we think is the role of uh, the tech and avoid solutions that are based on active communication between drones and in the specific case of UAV and advanced air mobility. Uh, Lee, do you, do you have any opinion about that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, since uh, there is no uh, pilot on board uh, an unmanned aircraft uh, looking out of the window of a fly deck, uh, the AA uh, systems are being uh, standardized uh, to establish acceptable alternative means of compliance with uh, sea and avoid uh, regulations, uh, which include uh, 14 CFR uh, 91113B requiring uh, vigilance shall be maintained by each person operating an aircraft to see and avoid other aircraft. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl, Rick, any opinion? Yeah, I think DAA plays a huge safety role in the active communication in between um, anything they're using with right, AAM, UAVs. Um, I think what DAA does is offer up that position where you actually have um, a visual of what's going on in the air and what's around you. So I think really what it is is a safety, a safety um, connection, and then you also get your visual base on ground in between the active communication. So it really ties everything in and gives you one great experience to look at whoever's on the ground station. So Stefana, I think you were specifically talking about unmanned aircraft and active communication between drones. And I, I think a lot of the drone world has been a little frustrated that the traditional um, crewed aircraft are allowed to operate without even electrical systems. So they don't have to have anything on board. And, and I think a lot of the drone world would love if they could mandate ADSB out or some sort of active communication to all aircraft in the air. But <clears throat> politically, we are where we are and there are allowed to be aircraft out there without communications. But as we move into allowing drones newly into the airspace, it seems like a prudent time to require that they do have active communications about their position and their intent so that they can share that with other AM and UAS aircraft and have that active communication so that they can clearly communicate where they are, where they're going, and have a two-way communication um, for effective separation. Those are very good points. I, I think I'd like to interject a question that is somehow a little bit dif different, but I think it comes from the things that you all just mentioned. Uh, we always hear about uh, drones having to avoid obstacles, having to avoid other vehicles. So <laughs> that means that drones need to have visibility of all of these. So uh, d do you feel there is an importance of uh, uh, for drones uh, to have visibility of uh, uh, piloted crewed aircrafts? But do you feel that all these DAA solutions should also provide a way for uh, crewed aircraft to be able to see drones? Because that is a topic that is not really well discussed. So making drones visible to airplanes, practically. <clears throat> should be part of the overall solutions and regulations and standards. 
So as a pilot myself and flight instructor, I personally believe that it, it, it should be possible, but um, we also worry about too much clutter. Um, a lot of times uh, you just get overwhelmed with the amount of information in the cockpit. If there's a bunch of uh, drones operating below 400 feet and you're at 10,000 feet, uh, that's just annoying. You know, that's not, that's not pertinent information to what you're doing. So, so while the information may be available to, to a helicopter operating low or on a particular mission, obviously, um, you know, it has to be up to the pilot to, to, to detune or to, to declutter um, the information that isn't pertinent to their particular mission at the time. But I, I do see your point. It is valuable if you imagine um, police or other helicopter operations that have to operate low and off airport. Um, they would like to know where any drones are operating and, um, and so that they can be uh, enhanced safety from uh, that awareness. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Stefano and Rick. Uh, according to 14 CFR 91113B, uh, uh, for uh, the encounter uh, that uh, involve a, a small UAS, i.e. drone, and any other man aircraft, the man air, uh, for any, uh, any types of encounter, head-on encounter, uh, conversion, and, and whatnot, uh, the main aircraft, the the main aircraft always has the right uh, of a way. So uh, it is the requirement and the responsibility of the remote pilot uh, of the uh, drone, i.e., small UAS, to uh, make the uh, maneuver to avoid uh, the collisions uh, to, to to the main aircraft. Thank yeah, you. most definitely. I would like to add in, um, you know, I think, Rick, you kind of hit the nail on the head there when you're saying it can get very cluttered, um, right? So especially if you're in a small plane, you're in the air and you're seeing all these UAS on ground, um, it could get a little confusing, a little scary, a little cluttered. I've had that happen before. Um, so I think that brings up a great, a great conversation of remote ID and when we're implementing that, when that's going to be there. Um, I think definitely keeping it separate from ADSB in. Obviously, ADSB out is not allowed on any UAV vehicles. Um, so, right now at this time, since remote ID isn't really open and for everybody and it's just kind of getting started, um, ADSB in for any kind of UAV I think is definitely necessary. Um, it's definitely one thing we include in our DA system. So, not only are you getting vision based um, awareness of your surroundings, letting you know that there's um, aircraft, helicopters, um, anything like that, that you're actually able to avoid and prevent collision from. Um, you have ADSB in for your situational awareness. And at this time, I think it is important that for um, any 107 pilots who are flying these UAVs, that they monitor and they watch ADSB in um, because it's a little more easier for them to sit down at a ground station, take that all in, watch from your command, command and control station, and be able to make your best judgment off of that. And while I agree with Lee about uh, crewed aircraft having um, right of way most of the time, I have to say from previous experience, this Saturday I was on ILS approach into a towered airport and I got my approach clearance canceled by priority police drone operations. So that was a first for me that I was, I was a crewed aircraft on an ILS approach and I was told to break it off and turn left <clears throat> because of priority drone uh, police operations. And so there, there, it does seem like there's gonna be places in the future where drones can get priority over uh, manned aircraft. Yeah, I, I think these are all very good points. Uh, what I'm hearing loud and clear is that, yes, all this information about visibility, mutual visibility are important. Uh, we need to be careful about overwhelming and find solutions that tie all of these into DAA that is realistic. Because as you said, if uh, the uh, crewed airplane uh, pilot or the remote pilot gets too much information, it's probably more damaging than not having the information because they just can't process it. So we need to be very careful. That are very, those are very good. And I think that brings me to another aspect when we talk about DAA. So how, how do you see DAA solution and command and control solutions interacting with each other? How do they complement each other? How do they work together? I think I can take that one on. Yeah. Um, so I think they complement each other perfectly. Um, when you think of a command and control station that 
Um, you know, you have your RIP, RPIC sitting in and you're doing BV loss. You have your waiver, you're set up for everything. Um, I hope that they have a DA system on board. And what you're doing is just giving that again, um, I think kind of connects back to our first question, right? You're getting that visual display of everything you're able to make the best judgment off of what's in your airspace. Um, you're able to avoid any kind of hazards. And um, they complement each other because not only are you monitoring your C2, you're monitoring your flight path, you're ma monitoring your airspace, um, and it's all easily done in one area. Um, one thing that Iris does is we leave it up to the customers with their DA uh, systems is to integrate that into their command and control whichever way they want so we're not saying hey you have to use our ground control station we work with other companies like kongsberg drone sense um, for you to actually have everything that you need in one very clear display um, and really what it does is just amps up that safety aspect of everything thank you Cheryl. Yeah, I uh, very much agree uh, with uh, what uh, Cheryl uh, saying. So that therefore, uh, the uh, uh, the city link uh, should uh, meet uh, the necessary performance uh, requirement, uh, in, uh, such as availability, uh, latency, um, continuity, reliability, and throughput, uh, to ensure the adequate uh, safety and operational suitability performance of the DEA systems. I just say the two work together very closely because what is C2 but commands and telemetry? So you're going to use that telemetry from the C2 system to know where your aircraft is, and that's going to feed into the DAA solution. And then part of the, the last A in DAA is avoidance. And while you can have automatic avoidance, you might have um, strategic avoidance by the pilot sending commands over the C2 link. So the two work hand in hand uh, to, to make a complementary system. That's very good. Now, uh, we, we discuss a, a little bit more higher level uh, aviation oriented uh, aspect, uh, but of course, we're here to discuss uh, the role of the 5G systems in all of this. So a question for uh, uh, the whole group is what 5G technology, what cellular technology do you think are relevant for uh, uh, the, the specific case of DAA and what, what needs to happen? for these technologies to be applicable to the AA? I think that C2 actually plays a huge role with uh, using 5G technologies. Uh, from, <clears throat> excuse me, years of experiment, experience uh, flying in the field, I think when you're thinking D DAA, you're thinking BB loss, you're thinking these long flying times and really these long flight paths, right? Um, one big issue that you come across is C2 connections. So I think 5G technologies could 100% help that. Um, I happen to be in Nevada where um, we're in salt flats. We have a lot of metal in the ground. We have a lot of minerals. We have a lot of things that impact um, certain C2 systems we're using. So when in field, I actually go a little uh, extensively on testing where, you know, I'm flying 400 feet and below, I'm flying all the way to the ground, you know, we're talking 10 feet off the ground, um, all through this flight path, and I'm just testing my own C2 systems. Um, and whether that's to put in a con op, the concept of operations for a waiver, or really just for my own knowledge and having confidence in my C2 system, um, I think what 5G can do is offer a C2 solution that, is really reliable, it's efficient. Um, of course, it may not work in all areas, but where you do have connection, I think that's a great way to monitor it and take advantage of what we already have in place with these technologies. Yeah. I'd add um, uh, to support that C2 um, strong connection is the RIC. Um, the, the intelligent controller allows you to really beam form that uh, signal between the drone and the um, base station or of the cellular network so that you get that strong signal and avoid a lot of the interference. Um, while Cheryl's system seems to work just fine without it, uh, we have partially the concept of using um, the mech or the edge computing to take uh, visual images off the drone, download it to the ground, and then compute them right there at the tower um, so that you can use that for avoidance. I don't know if there's a future product in Cheryl's thing that might use that kind of technology, but um, 
the whole idea is to offload that heavy computing off the drone and put it onto the tower um, computing ca capability. Yeah, I very much agree with uh, Cheryl and, and Rick. I'd just like to uh, add, though, that uh, in, in order to um, make uh, happening uh, for these uh, 5G technologies uh, to be adopted, then uh, we need to uh, complete uh, the uh, flight demonstration testing for uh, those relevant use cases that Jerry mentioned uh, earlier, uh, as well as uh, that, that will uh, certainly uh, facilitate uh, the development of uh, performance standards, right? Of the uh, C two link, or the other uh, uh, the other is the V two V link uh, using five G technologies. So once those performance standards are uh, developed based on the results of these uh, uh, flight uh, testing uh, uh, that, that, for example, the, the uh, accomplished by the uh, OpenGen five uh, G uh, consortium. Uh, in partnership with uh, the other uh, 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 the test bed facilities, uh, th then um, the uh, type certification and operational approval uh, of uh, these uh, DAA uh, uh, systems uh, and collision avoidance systems uh, will follow, and and, and then uh, that uh, will uh, facilitate, you know, m making uh, the uh, into in, into a reality and enter the market. Excellent. So uh, I, I'm hearing a lot of points here that are very good. So I'm hearing the need uh, for uh, clear, strong, reliable communication over cellular networks uh, for command and control, but in particular also for DAA. So Rick, I particularly appreciate you uh, talking about these mobile edge computing solutions where we have processing close to the edge of the network, which means close to the actual flying vehicle, even if they are in the network, because these can offload some computational mm -hmm. patterns from a drone, because for as powerful as it may be, it may not necessarily be able to do all the images processing in real time in all scenarios. So that requires, of course, a strong, reliable, possibly low latency cellular connectivity. Uh, I think we also need to consider a scenario, of course, of where we operate uh, auto coverage. I mean, we have a lot of drone missions. They may not necessarily always be in complete coverage all the time. So, so uh, do you see a role for more uh, vehicle to vehicle or aircraft to aircraft uh, communications for the AA? Do, do you see uh, the use of technologies related to that? Similar to the, uh, some of the technologies that we use in the aviation field today, where we uh, aircraft communicate to aircraft. And do you see a role for cellular technologies in these? Well, uh, in aviation, we've used VHF comm for years. And, and there is a question of, are we going to use VHF forever? And um, already, um, the FAA and others are considering uh, reaching some of the ground uh, hardware uh, out there in the field via 5G networks, where we're running copper fiber is just not cost effective. So I think what you're asking is, is maybe is there a role for um, voice or two-way communication between uh, crewed and uncrewed aircraft um, over uh, cellular technology? And I think that's a very interesting idea. Um, you know, aviation has a, a long uh, tail, and so it's a little hard to get everybody equipped. But maybe uh, it could start out in a real limited basis with uh, two-way communication over cellular at very low altitudes between um, some coordinated operators or something like that. Yeah, it, uh, uh, Rick, uh, making a very good point. So uh, 5G's uh, uh, s uh, things such as uh, voice over IP uh, to uh, enable uh, the uh, two ways uh, voice comm uh, the, 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 the will, will be, um, you know, one of those scenarios uh, in the event of uh, uh, running into an out, 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 of, out of coverage, right? Uh, also, though, um, uh, a uh, unmanned aircraft equipped with an onboard DEA system with automatic response to a range resolution advisories uh, it, they, uh, can, can continue responding automatically to the RAs uh, uh, during the uh, loss of a link event of uh, the C2 using 5G technologies as well. 
uh, and other, uh, but outside from the 5G technologies, um, the uh, unmanned aircraft uh, should also be equipped with a uh, dual link uh, dissimilar uh, systems, uh, such as a, a SATCOM uh, C2, which uh, could be um, one of those uh, 5G, right? But it would have a satellite instead of terrestrial network. Yeah, I think those are all great use cases. And it's something that, um, you know, I think uh, first getting into field experiences and actually going out um, with UAVs, you don't think of everything really you need 5G for, right? Even the most basic of things. So, you know, we're talking about VHR, VHF radios, how we love them. They're easy. You can really use them for any use case, right? Uh, but really communications on ground as well. I mean, at this time we're using, you know, Bluetooth headsets where I'm getting maybe a mile of coverage, right? And then, okay, that doesn't work. Let me switch to a VHF radio then, because even on ground, those will work. Um, so for communications like that, you're thinking of just like the basic use of I'm caching maps on whatever ground control station I'm using uh, before I got into field for use. And then you're thinking, okay, well, if we want another situational uh, awareness display while we're in field, let's say uh, just as much as I use for flight for planning flights and monitoring airspace while in, you know, a small aircraft, I do the same with UAVs when I'm working on ground. It's just another safety aspect. And you're, you're sometimes going to need just the basic kind of connection for that as well. So I think we can go very high level to low level of what 5G technologies can offer us. If I can follow up on that, uh, one issue is for larger drones that do want to operate in the airspace where they need to talk to air traffic control, um, the idea of talking over VHF radio to ATC seems doesn't make a lot of sense when the person's on the ground. So I really see a role for cellular there where there's some sort of a, a voice switch at the FAA so that they can join in the party line that everybody else is on VHF comm, but the uh, unmanned aircraft are on uh, on, on cellular. Yes, uh, the FAA uh, for the past uh, uh, a decade now uh, ha has been uh, working on that uh, voice switch, uh, NAS voice switch program, which, uh, you know, once it happened and deployed, uh, could utilize 5G technologies, as Rick mentioned. Yes, it is a very, very good point. Uh, to consider, we, we have a question from the audience. Uh, I think we can actually take it now because I think it's relevant to what we mentioned now. So uh, the, the audience is asking what would be the role of uh, CPDLC, which is controller to pilot uh, data link communications uh, in this context. Uh, do you have an opinion? Well, um, uh, for, for the last uh, almost 10 years now, um the the air carrier uh like part 121 uh carrier uh air carrier operation uh they uh not required uh, but most of them already uh, have uh, cpdlc uh but uh, in the context of uh, 5g uh technologies uh to uh in in the future uh the, those uh are, are operators uh, they could uh, look into um the use of 5g's uh for cplc uh for uh for the example of uh, let's say uh to, to, um uh, controller to pilot communication so let me just uh clarify for the audience because not everybody may know is we've had text messaging on cellular for decades and decades and we've been trying to get it on uh on aviation for the same amount of time and CPDLC is a way that air carrier aircraft can basically get text messages to and from the uh, ATC. And so I, I think the question is really saying, you know, is there a role for that CPDLC uh, technology in drones? And as a GA pilot and aircraft owner, I can't even get that on my small aircraft. Um, but when you're talking about very large UAS, there, there are some operators and, and vendors that would like to operate in class A above 18,000 feet. Um, that would make a lot of sense for them to get um, something like CPDLC on a very large uh, drone, and, um, and and so that, that that there's probably a use case for for that kind of technology. Yes, an uh, example of those use cases uh, include uh, the uh, future uh, AAM, uh, where uh, these uh, VTOL uh, vertical takeoff and landing uh, EVTOL 
uh, or even the near term uh, C uh, C stall uh, conventional short takeoff and landing aircraft uh, operating uh, 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 takeoff and landing from these heliport or vertiport uh, in these low altitude uh, operation they could uh, use uh, CPDLC as uh, Rick mentioned and 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 also leveraging 5G technologies for the CPDLC uh, as well. Excellent. This was very good. Um, so we are talking a lot about command and control and the AA. And what what is your feeling with respect to the requirements for C2 and the AA? Uh, do we have a, the requirements very well defined? Is there need to do more work to define the requirements uh, or to refine them? What, what's your feeling overall about uh, what has been done and what is going on about defining requirements? for uh, DAA and command and control, uh, and, and the two working together to enable beyond, beyond vision line of sight. I think a lot of testing uh, needs to be done and um, putting together, you know, performance reports, anything that it may be, to actually put out being honest, being truthful, and actually doing the testing. Um, for the DA side of it at IRIS, we routinely do testing over the five years. If the weather is good, I'm out testing. I'm testing UAVs, I'm testing our air base system, I'm testing our ground base system. We're testing against actual aircraft. Um, we're doing it in simulators to amp that up. Um, and so everything we're putting out, these performance reports, these averages, everything is correct. Um, it's funny, one of those questions I always get um, when talking to people, oh, does your system actually work? Does it alert? Does it avoid? Um, is it real? And I'm like, yes, it is very real. Let me tell you. Um, it's uh, much more exciting to see in person than in video, to be honest, but um, it 100% works. Um, so putting out truthful, honest reports. Um, on the C2 side of things, one thing that I frequently run into is having the issue of getting a new c2 system and it's telling me i have 15 miles or uh, more right and then you get out into field and you have environmental changes so if this was tested you know on the east coast like i said i'm in nevada i'm in these rural areas i am over a lot of minerals a lot of metals um lots of mining going out here that drastically impacts c2 connections and it really interferes with it so I'm forced to go out and test these um, pretty stringently. And then that 15 miles can go down to two miles. Um, so it's kind of a letdown there. So really putting in the effort to test, to go forward, to do different environments, do different weather, everything that that entails. Um, you know, that is one thing I even do on the DA side. So I'm not just flying in Nevada, I'm flying uh, East Coast, West Coast. In the Midwest, I, I think I've kind of been everywhere, at least in the U.S. And then we have customers overseas, too. So we go international. And so we get that data as well. Um, and so I think really putting in the effort um, is great. And writing out those honest uh, performance reports and testing, just so, you know, customers, partners, whoever may be, reads it and fully trusts in that, really. I, I found that, uh, you know, there was kind of a morbid saying that, that most safety regulations from OSHA and other places are written in blood. In other words, somebody was injured or, or died from, and that's why that rule is there. And with a lot of that, we've done almost 20 years of paper exercises in, in what C2 and DA standards should be. And uh, I think we have a pretty good first cut at it. And, and at this point, I think we need more operational experience. And at that point, then we could iterate on what it really takes to have good C2 and DA, uh, what, the, what the metric has to be, how good it has to be. But uh, we, we have done a lot of paper studies over the last 20 years about uh, the standards of how good DA and C2 should be. And at this point, I think we need more operational experience to refine those numbers. Uh, definitely. And uh, the uh, OpenGen uh, 5G consortium, uh, in partnership with uh, New Air and other test batch facilities, uh, is just an example of uh, you know uh, doing uh, the necessary uh, uh, flight test, uh, flight testing, uh, in order to uh, facilitate right uh, 
uh, uh, ha having these uh, C2 and, and the EAA uh, re um, uh, the implementation, but uh, we, we're always going to uh, uh, need to uh, take the call um, uh, walk uh, approach kind of kind of thing, right? So, for example, uh, to date, uh, a special uh, weather certification of a small uh, general aviation airplane or helicopters doing agricultural uh, agricultural uh, application, it typically take about three to five years uh, to receive uh, a weather certification. Uh, granted that, uh, let's say these, uh, uh, well, by, by the way, uh, Methanet, uh, they uh, recently received uh, the first uh, spatial air weatherness uh, TC uh, from the FAA. So that would uh, basically um, uh, launch uh, a set of precedents, right, for other type certification of other small UAS BV loss operation. But 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 given that these um, uh, even the drone or the the, the medium size or the large UAS operating at high altitude, uh, they incorporate new technologies, uh, new and unique operations, as well as uh, as new airspace integration. So, so we should take a, 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 a call, walk and run approach. And again, the OpenGen 5G consortium in partnership with uh, the, uh, uh, the various test uh, facilities will uh, doing these flight testing for the various use cases will facilitate, uh, facilitate that. I just like to echo how important the airworthiness certificates are that uh, Lee mentioned. Uh, without an airworthiness certificate or with just an experimental one, the regulator kind of has to assume that the aircraft's going to fail at any time and you get no credit for the continuity of flight from that aircraft. As soon as you get into a utility or normal airworthiness certificate, now you can get a lot of credit that the aircraft you know, has a system and backup systems to safely stay in the air. You can make a, a reasonable safety case about how this operation is, is safe to fly beyond line of sight or over people or whatever the mission is you want to do. But that that airworthiness certificate in a normal or utility category is key to opening that door. We we got a couple of questions from the audience, and I'd like to take one of them now, and the other one I think we can address a little bit later. So please bear with me. So one of the questions is, uh, to what extent does modeling and simulation need to take place for all these technologies, and what are the challenges of doing it versus testing? And if you don't mind, I'll jump in with that. Uh, I think uh, uh, modeling and simulation is actually very important. So uh, let me speak as both. This moment. So we had done extensive modeling and simulation for the use of cellular technologies, both uh, uh, aircraft to ground and aircraft to aircraft, uh, because that is the first step really to understand uh, how technology works and what needs to be done. But uh, that is only one part uh, of the solution. The real world testing is very important. Uh, of course, uh, doing real world testing on millions of cases and possible scenarios become unrealistic. That's the sheer amount of work. But modeling and simulation can help a lot in creating a framework of what actually really needs to be tested in the real world because you, through modeling simulation, you can detect that certain scenarios work obviously, but as some others may be more challenging. And does the modeling and simulation can help you define what we really need to test in the real world? Because what are the challenges in this case, what ch the challenges scenario to test? Because then when we can demonstrate in the real world through the testing facilities that those scenarios work, then we have an overall vision view of what how the system will behave. And that is something very important, as uh, Lee and uh, Rick mentioned. OpenGen is focusing a lot of this testing with the various testing facilities. We are defining use cases. Uh, of course, we will not test, test every possible scenario imaginable. We will focus on the one that we consider challenging and more important. But to answer the question, yes, we need both modeling and simulation and the real world testing. There are two uh, parts of the overall solution, and uh, we think complement each other very well. 
I don't know if uh, the other panelists want to add something. Well, that. I just want to tie it back to Terry's um, talk yesterday and a few other speakers that talked about digital qu twins or mirror technologies. The idea is to close that loop in real time and have that simulation running all the time so that you know what to expect out of the system. And when your simulation differs from the real world, well, you either update the simulation or something's gone wrong in the real world, and it really gives you a, an extra level of safety and, and confidence in your operation. Yeah, yes, sir. And um, modeling and simulation uh, ha has been uh, uh, done by the applicant for the, the last uh, 50 years or so uh, for manned aircraft uh, uh, systems and certification. So now uh, for these uh, unmanned aircraft, uh, new technologies, new operation, and, and also involve new airspace integration. So certainly modeling and simulation will, uh, will, will, will uh, provide a lot of benefits, uh, cost saving as well as uh, doing all those scenarios. And flight testing will focus on, go focusing on the corner cases, right? And uh, when I uh, supported the uh, IPP, um, for GLTE, uh, the, the Verizon, uh, BVLOS uh, C2 uh, f fly testing, uh, uh, the uh, Verizon uh, Skyward did, did a lot of uh, modeling and uh, simulations before uh, doing the fly testing. And currently the FAA uh, via the safety, the FAA safety continuum, uh, they uh, required uh, these uh, small UAS, uh, i.e. drone, uh, beyond visual light of sight uh, operation uh, to, uh, to do a lot of durability and reliability testing, DNR testing. So for those uh, applicants, including MetaNet and Amazon and all of the other dozen or so applicant, current, current applica uh, applicants, they uh, did a lot of modeling and simulation for their C2 and DAA as well as other systems before they do the uh, durability and reliability testing, which is very costly. Yeah, I think everybody kind of explained it perfectly. Uh, we need both the simulator, the mon modeling, and then real world experiences, one to compare to each other, and then two, to kind of keep everything rolling, keep them kind of in sync with each other. Again, it's not really feasible that we can go out and test in every environment, every corner of the earth. Um, really, it's not cost efficient, it's timely, um, and we're not gonna tread water as fast as we would like to having to do that. So yeah, absolutely modeling, simulating, it is an absolute necessity. And Lee hit on it, but you need to get to 10 to the minus six, sometimes 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus ninth, and there's no way you can do enough flight testing to do that. But you can run millions and millions of simulations uh, at faster than real time and, and cover those corner cases. So that's part of uh, closing the safety um, case with, with the regulator. Yes, sir. And the FAA uh, have traditionally accepted, uh, let's say, for example, via uh, 14 CFR uh, 1309, uh, accepted uh, um, modeling and simulation in, in, in many cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let, let me jump in with something. And uh, um, I, I think it's a question, uh, Cheryl, that is close to your heart. So we are more used to discuss the talk about uh, active communication or uh, radio communications for DAA. But uh, you mentioned it briefly before. I think it's a very important topic. Uh, besides this communication or this DA solution based on active communication, what is the role of uh, alternative solutions? We can call them sensor-based or sensor augmentation solutions for DAA, like electro-optical. You have a lot of experience on this. So can, if you have any comments, that would be really appreciated. Uh, I want to be sure that I understand the question correctly. So it's what is the active communication role in between uh, like DA and ground-based system? The opposite. What is the role of uh, uh, sensor augmentation uh, like electric optical solutions uh, in DAA? And how important do you think it's going to be? I think it's going to be extremely important. Um, I have experience with, you know, radars, lidars, acoustic systems. Um, and honestly, when you look at those, you look at the price, you look at the efficiency of them and the overall performance of them. Um, I would say that electrical optical is huge. Um, 
I think it really compares to, you know, what we're saying, a pilot's eye, right? Um, we need to be able to see what's in the air. Uh, one thing that I love about Iris's system is we classify. So you're not just going along your flight path and not knowing what you're seeing. Uh, you know, it's you have radars and you have acoustic systems and they'll just tell you there might be a collision. Watch out. There's something in the air flying at 400 feet with you. That's great. I'm going to uh, lower my altitude and try and avoid it. Um, if you have our ground-based system, what it does is actually bring up a picture. Um, so it would be amazing to show you right now, but um, it pops up a picture and it actively tracks that aircraft. So what you'll see is, you know, a small aircraft coming along the way or another drone and it classifies it and it lets you know, oh, you have a drone flying at this heading, this velocity, this altitude, um, you should avoid it. Um, and if you have our onboard system, then you have the opportunity for it to just alert you or to actively avoid that. Um, so I think electrical optical is definitely something that's needed. Uh, again, we use um, ADSB in as well to give another situational awareness tool. So you're not, you know, questioning that you're actually seeing this. You can see ADSB in, you can see that the aircraft's right there. You can see they're actively tracking, t tracking together. Um, so I think they it plays a huge role in everything in DA and especially when you're thinking BV loss um, and making this a reality for the future. So yeah. that's like, sorry, the fact that you're putting the pilot eyes on the vehicle without putting the pilot on the vehicle. Exactly. That, that makes sense. Absolutely. And um, as uh, Cheryl uh, mentioned, uh, uh, some of these uh, DAA architectures, uh, they also uh, fuse right the uh, data the, that uh, track data uh, from uh, co cooperative uh, as well as from non cooperative uh, sensors. They fuse these uh, track data together and then uh, prioritize the track data before send it to uh, the uh, DAA uh, either on board or on the ground uh, processes for. Uh, for um, you know, uh, doing the uh, processing of the uh, intruder uh, track data uh, to uh, issue uh, 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 alerts and maneuver guidance. Yeah, absolutely. It would be very confusing if you had um, you know 360 cameras and something was going along. You're getting a hit off of each one. So yes, uh, Lee, correct. We actively track and we give off one icon, letting you know. Um, I think. Another great feature of actually being able to see and know what's there and having a classification is great. Um, again, I'm in Nevada. I'm kind of what may be considered as wild, wild west, right? Mm -hmm. So legally, everybody should have ADSB out on small aircraft. And we all love that. It's not a reality all the times when you have, you know, people making runways in their backyards and having hangars at home. Um, they're coming out and they're flying on these salt flats and tail draggers or whatever it may be um, and so I've literally been out in field testing and had no ADSB in I've had four flight up I've had my own DA systems up um, no awareness except for maybe I hear something I hear like a twin engine prop I hear a tail dragger coming in something I don't know where it is I'm scanning the air and then Cassia actually picked it up before I did I picked it up, it showed me a picture of it, it showed me exactly what aircraft it was, showed me the correct location, and I looked at my screen, I looked up, there it was. 